Good afternoon. So my purpose today is an addendum to the Born Left Emancipation post on Substack. And um, there's a couple of things I need to clarify in there. Um, what I've discovered since that post, which was about a month ago when I recorded that, um, was that I had a period of a few years, actually, especially the first year, like January 1st, 2015, is when I had completed the taper of the meds I was on at the time, Lamictal, Abilify, Seroquel, and Valium. And I was, had depression, bipolar, whatever. <clears throat> PTSD. Finally, a diagnosis that would actually apply to me uh, because of early trauma that I still didn't really remember. But um, uh, regardless, um, so in on January 1st of 2015 is when I completed the taper and that was you know eight nine years it'll be it'll be nine years next month because uh, in two weeks we'll have January 1st 2024 so that's nine years um, right now on social media and in the news and there there's always <clears throat> I don't know if the news is filtered for everybody gets the same news. I don't think that. <clears throat> but I have definitely found news articles and gone to, I will click on the news article if it's about a lawsuit. <clears throat> so I heard about a lawsuit uh, against a drug company for um, opiates. And even Texas has this big, like, you know, nonprofit now because they got billions of dollars for opiate abuse that was pushed on the public and so now they have a nice nonprofit. Um, I don't think the addicts are ever going to see any of those billions but at least they're talking about it right and um, and I also saw another one which I haven't been able to click on the article but um, the very first drug they put me on when they put me in the hospital at sick when Alex was six months old and that was my choice. My husband and I had talked about it and the way they presented it, you know, you deserve this. It'll, you know, give you an edge and, da -da. you know, you if you put it off, it's just going to get worse. And then you could lose everything. Well, I ended up losing everything. Just going in the hospital, the, the, being willing to do what they asked. This was life care in Fort Worth, <clears throat> which doesn't exist anymore, but I'm sure those same people are shuffling around. Um, they put me on Haldol. And uh, I just recently discovered a woman named Johanna Moncrief, and she's from the school in London. They have a, um, she's from the University of London, she's written a book, a couple of books. I need to find her other books, but she said there were studies published that showed how Dahl had shrunk the brains of monkeys within the first month or two. And that there was another medication, I don't know what its name was, um, that it took a year. And But they re recommended that you stay on these drugs. These were like antipsychotics and, you know, uh, and this was 91. So this was very early in the push. Uh, they really didn't send out like the marketing full on until 92. But yeah, they got me early. So, um. I really didn't notice the symptoms of um, my head shrinking until I completely went off the medication. Like I didn't notice the problems. I just, uh, within a year I was back in the hospital because I was having protracted withdrawal from trying to get off the medications they put me on. 
So all these symptoms, like they, they have a real hard time distinguishing from withdrawal symptoms and what they call relapse. So um, it was earlier this year that I had found an article about how thyroid, a hypothyroid can mimic as mental health. Well, depression is a symptom just like anything else. So if you're being abused um, by, uh, you know, an authority figure, in my case, I was in an abusive marriage and I was in a very strict religion that I completely attributed to, you know, like goodness and God and everything. But there were mechanisms behind the scene and church leaders and all these politics things going on that I, I had absolutely no idea of. I had no idea any of that was a factor or existed. Um, so in my, um, logistically, after I had my third C-section in four years, I was necessarily weak and um, I had, um, just found out about my oldest uh, being deaf so I had to address his needs and then I had had the 11 pound baby that put me into a hypothyroid condition the year prior but the doctor that I had in Fort Worth he was an osteopath and he said you have thyroid so he put me on thyroid medication and I bounced back within a couple weeks I was back in church singing in the choir I mean I was non-stoppable if, as long as I was, you know, treated appropriately. So after my third baby, instead of it being, oh, she's, you know, got thyroid again, well, that's understandable and it takes time for these hormones to level out. But by then, my husband had had a, a back injury and we ended up moving away from his mother, which was made him very depressed and he was becoming abusive and I had the three little babies. I had no help. We were living out in the country and nobody came to help me. No one. I had no help. So yeah, I was tired. I was weak. And it, I was told that I had depression. And so they put me on Haldol and I think Prozac on top of that, which destroys your sexual functioning so I wasn't able to really even be a sexual partner to my husband um, yeah it, it, the dominoes just sort of and I, I recovered you know I, I kept trying to recover and get back on my feet but once you receive that stigma of mental illness chemical imbalance which there, there are many studies now that are coming out now 2023 now they're discovering that there was no evidence for that, that that was just a political marketing ploy so that the drug companies could sell these drugs to people because they make them compliant. They make them dead inside. They make them, you know, they're not exactly what you would consider a fun drug to take to combat feeling bad. I mean, does it make sense to take a drug that makes you feel dead inside if you already feel dead inside or if you're depressed and sad? So, you know, is it medical malpractice? Well, these are not medis medical professionals. These are marketing. I mean, they did a good job. They marketed a product that was very successful. They destroyed my life and I'm still stigmatized. Stigma, stigma. I still have stigma. I still have to fight for my, the, the, the false assertion that there's something wrong with my mental anything. The fact that, I mean, is, they, they can't even prove that mental illness is a physical, biological problem. It's not. It's a, a like emotional body problem. Um, but it's a symptom of something else. Like you can have thyroid issues and feel depressed, depression uh, as a result of the thyroid. So if you fix the thyroid or if you, you know, like there's food, you know, I always used food for medicine. In fact, food is medicine. So, you know, 
I reached out to the doctor that uh, has a Texas uh, office about the uh, protracted withdrawal, and they said, "Oh no, we're we're only they're only taking patients of people who want to get off the drugs now." So I was on them for twenty four years. Yes, my head is smaller. In fact, I am three inches shorter and at least two hat sizes smaller in my brain. So they shrunk my brain and they made my body even smaller. I was five one and a quarter. Now I'm like 4'11 at best. So, um, but you know, these, you know, chemical imbalance and all that stuff, there's, there's plenty of people running around talking about that as if that is some kind of medical fact. And it is medical fiction and has taken hold in all of our institutions, medical institutions. And, you know, there's nothing holy. If there's, they've estimated that 10% of all people who go to like a general practitioner, which is just about everybody, 10% of those they could probably sell antidepressants to. And it's not just the antidepressants. Now they're taking the antipsychotics. And you notice antidepression, antipsychosis. Well, depression isn't fatal and it's not actually a disease in and of itself. It's more of a, uh, a symptom of something um, physical going on or even emotional. Um, figure that. Antipsychotic, that if you're psychotic, um, then you take this pill and that will reverse it. So it's sort of like you're depressed, take the pill, take an antidepressant, it makes you not depressed. You're psychotic, you take the pill and it makes you not psychotic. Well, does like is psychosis fatal? Um, they're saying that people can live through psychotic experiences and recover. It doesn't really cause any damage. What causes damage is the drugs they give people. That causes the damage. It causes brain damage. It causes central nervous system damage. And because they are, um, they're mind altering drugs, it can uh, change your personality. And um, it wasn't until I came back three years ago to my fa my family home that um, I kept hearing them say to me, you know, my kids, we just want our old mom back. Well, I don't know what that means because I've suffered brain damage. I mean, all those years I was uh, after, you know, like 2015 and, and 2016. And, um, you know, I went to Luling to try to uh, work at a, um, to build a recording studio at a tiny house village. And, um, you know, I was coerced. I was, you know, I was coerced and uh, threatened. And then um, my own child was angry at me and threatened me. And, uh, you know, it just... When I'm looking back, by 2016, 2017, the protracted withdrawal, the the realization that I was different, I'd lost close to 80 pounds, so I was really emaciated, and I just looked like death. And it's gone. You know, whatever that life force I had that I used to live my life and create my family and, and do good things for them and make their life fun and loving and all that was stripped away and even now you know i've just had a granddaughter and my own daughter thinks that because i'm not on meds and because i'm supposedly unstable how would she know she's seen me like a handful of times in one year in fact when i came back three years ago it took her six months to just see me in person they were so terrified of me and she's in the medical community now too, so she's gotten a lot of that propaganda really crammed down her throat. Like, they have a way of convincing you of something that is completely false and you believe it. You think it's true. And it's so far from the truth and it can be proven that it's propaganda, but you can't tell people that are 
You know, no one could tell me when I was, you know, answering the phone, Jesus loves you, I was brainwashed. And it wasn't that, you know, Jesus doesn't love you. It's just that to kind of get that all convoluted and it be in a passion to, like, recruit people to change their mind. I mean, I was, like, sort of sent out as this agent of transformation to convert everybody to my religion, whether they had a, you know, an old religion or, you know, they were pagans from Norway. Norway. I mean, it was still upon me to convert them. I mean, it was like nobody was safe. Nobody was sacred. Nobody was off the, ta off the table. Just like these drugs. They're going to go after children now and they're going to try to medicate children with antidepressants because they can because it's money, because it gets people, it get, makes people like, you know, zombies. And I was a good worker, you know, when I finally did get into the workplace, you know, after some turbulence, you know, I never dropped my music, but I, I did make, you know, good money. I was capable, I was smart, I could do a lot of things. My favorite thing is writing music and, and um, creating poetry and, you know, I like to draw and do kinds of those kinds of creative things. But it's uh, like a kind of like rehabilitation now. Like that's what you do when you're in a rehab center is you, uh, you know, you knit or you, um, you make, um, you know, hot plates and clay. It's something for, you know, the idiots to do. So that's, you know, and once once you're stigmatized with that, you know, the entire world is perfectly content for you to keep that. And that means that, you know, no one ever had hope for me before I was in special class until eighth grade. And I sat there the first day of school looking at <clears throat> one plus seven is eight, and I just cried. And I got up and walked out of the room. I went right to the principal and I said, this is bullshit. I want a class that I will learn in. This is ridiculous. It's like kindergarten stuff. And so I promoted myself and I pushed myself. I went into a like a um, seminar history writing uh, class. And then I did some um, psychology stuff for the school because I needed extra credit because I had been skipping school every day and I wasn't going to graduate because I was taking over a radio station in Worcester and I took over both the AM and the FM and I learned everything there was and I was going to be an engineer. Got my FCC license and, you know, Bob's your uncle. That was never going to end and it still hasn't ended. I just don't have a radio job yet right now, but, you know, I will someday or get my own, make my own radio station or something. And I'm not dead yet. And, um, you know, I'm still vibrant and alive. But um, two weeks ago, I um, went out on the road and someone cut in front of me. And I almost bashed my head in. I did break my nose. And I can't walk very well. But I could hobble to the car. And, you know, I was... Things were coming back to some semblance but it's very difficult when everyone you know believes a lie it's a falsehood and everything in the system supports it well they'd be more than happy if I went to a doctor and got you know Prozac again or whatever the late Lexapro and I don't know these things are very dangerous medications. And the psychotics, the antipsychotics, are even worse. Um, and they, they tried to shoot me up with morphine at the hospital. And I freaked out. They put morphine in my IV? I don't think so. I'm leaving. I'm, I literally jumped out of my skin. And uh, my son called them, and they said, oh, yeah, she freaked out, and, you know, she's just such a crazy person. Yeah. Mm. Shoot, me, shoot me up with morphine, huh? No, thank you. They did give me, like, a 
synthetic opioid for pain. And I took it for like a week. Headaches, skin crawling. I mean, it just, these are poison. And luckily, I, you know, thankfully I feel better and I don't have to take it now. But, um, you know, I want to contact these people. And maybe Dr. Witt Doring, whatever his name is, will let me um, do a, you know, do an interview. I'm going to email them again and see if they'll let me, um, if he'll um, interview me. I don't, I don't think there's, I could do this on my own. I was going to try to gather some of the tests and, you know, and try to advocate for myself, but yeah, lawfare doesn't really work. The only thing that's going to work is if something from the outside, like broadcasts it, like with a trumpet. People need to know, and I'm not, I'm really not expecting anybody to go, oh, I'm so sorry. I thought, you know, I didn't know, and that it, I don't expect any of that. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to rectify, correct the record, and defend my name, build a case to correct my name, because I have been slandered falsely by a system that wanted to make a killing off of selling drugs, and it did. It did. They made their money. So, I don't know. There's gonna, there's an avalanche coming. When the dam breaks, when people finally realize <clears throat> What these drugs are, some people have been on them for decades. Yes. Yes, they have. And they will try to get off of them. The brain, the damage has been done, but they don't care. It's like those pills they gave me. I could still feel the pain, but I didn't care. I, I like just, um, and they had like serotonin a reuptake of you like, antidepressant qualities in there too so I was feeling happy and you know but I could still feel the pain so I mean it's not really a painkiller it was more like a happy pill so you don't care and that's what being on the drugs does you don't care but it's shrinking your brain it's killing your sex life so we're I mean are we gonna have another generation come down the pike I don't know. If everybody's sterile, we won't. But um, once people realize what it is that they're actually taking and why, they're all going to try to get off. And it, when it goes mainstream, like some of us, you know, me, it's been personal. I've been fighting this battle for 10 years. Well, 34 years now because 20 or 30 years on the drugs, 24 years on the drugs, nine years off. So I've been fighting the battle with this whole situation all, all that time, uh, but it's going to be those first couple of years were really rough, and I already had you know quite a bit of going in my favor, my resilience, my pursuit of holistic health remedies from the time I was like. 18 I was always doing that I was always interested in that and I was very healthy because of that so um, I had a lot in my favor <clears throat> and still do because of all this the training I gave myself the autodidactic training yes I did get college degrees and all kinds of you know credentials but it was my own study and my own practice with health healthy things that is what is the reason I'm speaking to you today and not have killed myself because there were so many times I wanted to die and it's not because I want to leave this earth it's because the pain that you feel that akathasia you feel like you're being electrocuted from the inside out and you can't you can't do anything about it there's no drug it's because of the drugs it's the withdrawal symptoms it's getting off of the drugs. And I saved the Valium for last. And for that reason. Because I kind of knew. I kind of had a feeling. 
this one's going to be the hardest. And I didn't know why. I just, way I got all the other ones out of my system. And then I stopped the Valium on January 1st of um, 2015. Um, yeah, and the pain that you feel and the, that restlessness and just feeling electrocuted. Um, you, you don't want to be around. You don't want to do it. You don't want to be here. It's just too painful. And then when family members and people get angry at you and then, you know, threaten you and, you know, ostracize you, being ostracized, you know, I've heard from the all the most experienced doctors, the ones that are dealing with these people now, that psychotic situation, that few days or that few moments or there's something that you just get to the point where you just can't handle it anymore. Having someone there, just physically there to be present. Sometimes that's all you need. You don't need a bunch of advice. Nobody can, you know, there's nothing to say. They're suffering and there's no, there's no pill. It's because of the pills. We don't need these pills. But anyway, just having someone there, uh, just to be with you, be present, so you don't feel like you're gonna, you know, go off the rails, is sometimes all you need. And when people refuse to provide that because of their own fear, and then criticize you for freaking out and not having it, it just makes it, it exacerbates it. it and then they blame you because you're responding to that, that Lone, that isolation and being alone. How cruel. How cruel is that? Oh my God. The cruelty of people on this planet, in this country, in this state, in my family. The cruelty. Get off of your high horse and your freaking, you know, knowledge and degrees and your pride and your ego, my triggers and my. Oh my God. Be a human. Hold someone's hand. Just hold their hand. How hard is that? You don't have it in you? Well, then you're not human. Or something in you that was human has died. You're going to need that human part, by the way. Eventually, you're going to have to bring it back around and go, um, where is that? I know I put it in the closet or it's in the, you know, the basement of the, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to need it. You're going to need it. So I'm not mad at anybody. I'm. It's time for somebody to care. I'm going to build a case for my normal, the normal that I had. And I never gave up and it's never left me because it was normal. It was normal to me. It came natural to me and that's why I did it. And it's still there. It never left. That other stuff was unnatural witchcraft i don't know this these medications that create altered states that is what they do antipsychotic medication creates psychosis it's always the opposite they might as well just call it psychotic minute you want to be psychotic here take these pills that's what they did to me and i survived it i think i say i survived it it's um let's see it's the 15th of December, 2023, and I survived it to today. But there has to be a revolution of thought. There has to be a revolution of humankind saying, oh my God, that's mean. That's not, we don't, we're, we can do better. We don't have to be mean. And it doesn't cost any. be kind it might cost you your ego and pride maybe but you can always build that back up when you need it but if somebody in your family or someone you know needs you and is having a hard time you know don't cut them off don't shut them out for, because you're afraid talk about it to them say I'm afraid I'm afraid you're going to attack me. I'm afraid you're like unstable and 
you know, you're not on your meds and da 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 da. Well, here's some literature or here's a, you know, a book. Um, are you willing to accept that corporations do things to make money, not necessarily benefiting humans? Can you admit that? And that that, that, that might apply here. It does. There's so much. I mean, I'm late to the game. I'm just 10 years in. But I did listen to a, um, a woman who said that she's a nurse. And she said that she's like a physician's assistant. So she kind of, she does, she can do prescribing. And, you know, she's helping with the, you know, detoxing people from benzos and antidepressants and stuff. Because it's real it's becoming just an epidemic people are going to realize that they they have brain damage and the only responsible thing to do is first stop the damage which means you have to stop taking these things that are damaging you they literally shrink your brain after a year so what about 24 years how did i even survive it well i could go back, reverse engineer that period of time and show all the turbulence my kids went through, I went through, all the terrifying experiences I was exposed to with no one to help me and having to just um, try to figure it out and, um, and all the accidents and, you know, just life-threatening things that I, you know, I put myself through a lot because you don't feel. So you're willing to take risks or you're willing to do crazy things that other people would take a step back and say, well, let's talk about this, see what the risks are, what the benefits are. You know, you can't do that. If you have no feeling and you don't care, you just don't care. And it's not because you don't care. It's because you're on drugs that are altering your mind that make you extremely passive. <coughs> So, I reverse engineered, not thoroughly, no, but I'm still trying to deal with the, the protracted withdrawal, which is really just um, a drug injury to my brain and my nervous system. And a meditation really helps. The daily practice um, really helps. It's very kind. It's very loving. Um, but the isolation and the being ostracized even today from my family is what continues the process. I mean, it just it will continue the tradition of this abuse until people stop abusing each other. You can't heal from something if you're continually doing it. You can't heal from a poisoning if you're continually taking the poison. And they had people on it. Some of the meds I was on, I was taking uh, more than once a day. But I was taking it daily. So, yeah. So, there's a lot there. And um, I don't know who this is going to offend or hurt or, you know, we just, it's time to be honest. And um, we're never going to unpack it until we are. You know, and so it has to start with me. I have to start being honest about what happened, how I feel about it. Um, you know, I don't resent anybody. Really, I don't. I understand everybody's been traumatized in some way, especially the people that were connected to my life because they saw what I was doing and they were under the, uh, the misconception that I was somehow self-generated. But... It started out with postpartum depression, which is very normal, in fact. Especially after you have big babies like I had. I mean, she was almost eight pounds. And um, for them not to treat the thyroid or even, you know, address the hormonal imbalance and just... And not just that, but not having help. I should have got uh, someone to come to the house and help me. I had three babies. And lived out in the country and had no help. And an abusive husband. I mean, come on. Come on. This is not normal. It's not, not normal. 
and the fact that I lived through it is not a feather in my cap. I'm sure there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, are going to have to reckon with this, like the professionals there in that hospital and the people that gave permission for everyone to get drugged like this and destroy your life. Those are the people that would wish that all of us would just off ourselves. It would have been so convenient. And there were so many times I wanted to. Um, but my reasoning was, and, it, and it's reasoning, okay? It's, it's reason, that logic and reason, which I was heavily trained in, logic, knowledge, and philosophy, by my dad and in my college, reason told me that if I'm having an emotional pain, cutting myself down, my physical body down, is going to solve it. I knew it wasn't physical. So I couldn't justify killing my physical body off. I just didn't want to feel the way I was feeling. And there's a lot of reasons for that. So, you know, people need to get humble and they need to believe people. Like if someone tells you about themselves, whether they're deluded or not, that's none of your business. Would you want people to just mistrust everything you say because, well, you're probably not, not right. You're probably wrong about yourself. Yeah, they know better. And you know intrinsically when you tell someone how you really feel, you're telling them from your perspective. I mean, I don't, I don't know where the wording gets lost here, but am I not telling you how I feel? Okay, so that must be me talking about me. <laughs> and you have absolutely no reason to question that and it's probably in your best interest to just believe me got no reason to lie and it would benefit me not to even manufacture anything and i admit that sometimes i do exaggerate and i think that people that exaggerate is because they haven't been heard you haven't been listened to and so they're trying to prove a point it's like do you hear me yet? And the remedy for that is just to hear them. And maybe a little bit of tolerance and patience. Especially if you love them. Use love. What's wrong with that? I mean, where's the love? And probably just listening to them. Getting them through that moment is enough. You never know. But you can't believe that it's all the people's fault. I talk about this movie all the time. It's called A Place of One's Own. And James Mason is in it. It's 1949. Something about that year. All the movies made in that year I love. <clears throat> but this one, it's got Margaret Lockwood as the companion to the older lady. And she's hired to just kind of keep her company. And she's retired, so she hires this young girl to come and, you know, help her put on her jewelry and do things with her and stuff. And um, the house is haunted, and the girl is very sensitive and kind of a, you know, very female. And she's inhabited by this ghost, and she does, like, piano, and she does all this other stuff. But they never blamed her. They never said, oh, she's crazy. No, they're like, what's wrong with her? Oh, my God, the house is haunted. So, they said, maybe... Um, if we acknowledge that it's haunted, and we... Um, do something about it like try to resolve that that situation you know sh there are ways to dispel spirits that are you know lingering about and one of them says oh if I was to believe all the rumors you know we'd be convinced that the very highways are congested with the spirits of the departed hmm well, if they left and they were not expecting to leave or if they were ejected and just sort of, you know, killed immediately or there's a war and there's a bomb and blah, 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 and people are not prepared, there might be quite a few of those lingering about um, in the fourth, fifth dimension. They're not, they're not really human. So, you know, we have a lot to learn. We have a lot to digest and figure out. Um, 
and I'm here for triage when people want to come out as well like if people want to come out I can help them detox um, the main thing is just to keep at it until they're all gone and don't go back don't go back there's no there's no prop they're all poison unless they actually produce a beneficial effect but that's what food is for believe it or not food is our medicine and um, I've been practicing food medicine for 40 years so I know that's true but um, so that's all I want to say I'm just gonna begin this whole journey there's a couple of articles I'm gonna put up and I'm gonna try to uh, to unpack this thing I have to fight for my name and um, not everybody um, I think a lot of people were traumatized raped abused and when they broke down and needed to like just get it out and talk about it somebody whisked them up put them in a hospital stuck them in drugs and that was 20 years ago you know it's over because once you're on those drugs you don't care anymore and you just sort of slowly by slowly become automaton till you just really can't think of a reason to care why would i care I remember there was a moment, so it was a little lady coming out of the, behind me, and I didn't really, why should I care to hold the door for her? Like, that's how bad it is. Like, you can't really care. So, and I don't know what the, what the, the drug does, but it does make you that way. It does, you know, kind of, there's a part of it that just makes you, like, not care. So, but I care now. I care about me, and I'm going to fight for my uh, my my name. And um, I don't care who supports it. I have to care enough to support it, and I do. So with that, I'll have to close, and I wish you all a wonderful day. Bye.